Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Roz Jones. She is the owner of a um, home health company. Mm -hmm. And we are going to discuss documents you need when you're taking care of a loved one. And that's any loved one, not just somebody living with Alzheimer's, but she is going to touch a tiny bit on the extra ones we need for those. So thanks for joining me, Roz. You are so welcome. You are so welcome. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak before your community. You're welcome. This is not a topic. It's like paperwork is not my thing. So. <laughs> it's not sexy. Anything about caregiving is that's true. It's not sexy, but it has to be done. It has to be, and particularly now in uh, COVID has really shifted everything for caregivers. If you have Alzheimer's dementia, whatever the case may be, it has taken a huge shift. And if you don't have the documentation, if you really don't have it now, a lot of things are going to happen that you didn't want to happen. Yeah, I believe that. I just, I know my dad had all his stuff together when he was in and out of the hospital right at the end of his life. He had moms pretty much put together. And because she was in a care home, like we'd go to the doctor this was always frustrating. They'd say, well, what medications are she on? Like, you tell me you're the one that subscribed them. So I always had to make a mental note to get the list from the med tech at the care home she was in so that I could tell the doctor who prescribed this. I was like, oh, people, I don't need to know about the medication because the doctor tells the care home and the care home orders them. And that's all, that's the, I set it all up so I didn't have to worry about it. So that's kind of how I handled paperwork. My husband is a paperwork guy. He's a real estate broker. So paperwork is his thing. So where do we start with documents? And how, how should we have them? Should we have them scanned into our phones as well as paper copies? Let, look, letter E, all of the above. The more people that have copies, the better. And, and the reason why I say that is because even with the pandemic, we still have hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, earthquakes. Well, so I'm in California, fires. Okay, and, 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 and my client's son is in California as well. So anything could happen. Anything could happen to where you can't get back to that paper copy or you can't get to the computer or to the bank, to the safe or wherever you keep those documents. So I tell people not only have copies with you, but to a relative that that's, you know, or friend that's not in the same area as you. So if something does happen, hey, can you send me a copy? Can you email it? And now in some states, um, at some facilities, it's required that you wear an ID bracelet hmm. with all your documentation in there, which is good, particularly for people who have Alzheimer's. If something happens in the middle of the night and you can't get in contact with the loved ones, then all the information is on a bracelet. So, you know, there's things out there now that, um, that can assist you. Um, remember when the ID bracelets came out a long time ago to let people know if you are insulin and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So, um, you know, uh, you know, the paper versus an electronic, however you can get it done, get her done. But please take it out of that accordion folder, that brown <laughs> accordion folder, please. <laughs> <sighs> Probably a wise idea to have it stored in the cloud. That way, if you, you know, end up somewhere, you know, here in California, hello, well, this year, <laughs> the chances of a house burning down are getting pretty high. And, you know, we have like, we have a Dropbox account that everything is in, like right. all the podcast recordings, all my husband's paperwork, personal files, everything. It's like, pfft. It's not cheap, but it's worth it, you know, because I can access it wherever I have a good internet connection, which. You can't put a price on peace of mind. And when it's, and when the, you know, when the final breath is taken, you don't want to look through someone's house for, for insurance papers, DD 214s, birth certificates, marriage license. You don't want to prove, you know, that I'm related to this person. So that you can take, because a lot of times now states are, are wanted to know that, okay, how do I know this is your mother? How do I know this is your father? You know, they're going through extra steps to protect themselves. The funeral homes, the nurse, nursing homes, the hospitals. You know, I could say, Jennifer, you're my mom. 
<laughs> how do I know, you know, how do I know Jennifer's my mom? You know, I could be a mixed baby. You know, they don't know. That's they true. don't know. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we need documentation. It's not like it used to be where the family stayed in town. We all are moving away. And that's even more reason why you need documentation. Then you have long, long term, long distance caregivers, just like with the client I'm here with now. Her son is in California. Her daughter is here. But, you know, what if some, one, something happens to the other or what, for whatever reason, you know? You got to have the documentation. It's, it's more important now than ever. So having it in more than one place in the cloud, on a, uh, you know, for those who still want that accordion folder, <laughs> if you're going to have an accordion, please scan it and give somebody a copy on the thumb drive or put it somewhere. <laughs> and if you really have to have it in a safe deposit box, I understand, but make uh, make extra copies so that everybody has it. So, you know, the first thing, of course, is having the copies. The next thing is, I want to talk to you all about the insurance. Some of us have not checked to make sure that our insurance companies have not been sold to someone else. That does happen. I had that happen to a client that the... Um, the company got sold. They didn't know. And when it was time to get the policy, it took them almost a year to get the money Yikes! because they did not check on it every six months to a year to see they were sitting, the money was still being, the check would be in cash and auto draft, whatever was happening, but they didn't know who to get in contact with. Yeah. I'm trying to think, well, my dad was a Rotarian my husband and I are Rotarians, so mo many of the business people that we deal with are Rotarians. And you were talking about the funeral home. I laughed a little bit because when my dad passed away and he was at the funeral parlor, the gentleman in charge was a Rotarian, friend of my dad's, you know, acquaintance of my mm -hmm. husband and I. So it was like almost like a family friend. Cause I actually had to text him and say, you know, we've never found my dad's wedding ring. Could you um, <clears throat> go check <laughs> and see if he's wearing it, <laughs> which he was not. We never did find his wedding ring. And then, but he left between my dad passing away and my mom passing away. But the, some of the same people were there. Our insurance company, the P or the P our insurance broker, excuse me, mm -hmm. our family friends, they owe us many hours of dog sitting so I'm thinking, wow, that's a, re that's a really positive benefit of really knowing who you're doing business with, but it's not always possible for everybody. And, you know, I'm in a small city in Northern California, so it's not like I'm in the small town, but being in a Rotary Club helps. So, <laughs> like, yeah. <yay. laughs> you know, as, as we always say, we hear in the commercial, membership has its benefits, but if you are not fortunate to be a membership, you know, like, like you want to have the good friends and as time goes on and the person that got the policy forgot, or it has lapsed because it wasn't paid. And now to try to get one with a pre-existing condition and at the age of 80 or 90, most can't forget it. Want, you, you can't get it. And so that's why the power of attorney is important to help make sure those bills stay in place because the insurance policy you get now, you know, I tell people you need to ask, how long can you live? Because they, they only pay up to a certain, up to a certain age, you know, because they didn't expect people to live in their 90s and 100s like they are. You know, the older policies pay that. These new policies don't, you know, they don't want you to live over 80. Yeah. So what do you do after 80? <laughs> it's just, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge isn't that far away. <laughs> That's bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I think they have a net now, so that's not even an option. <laughs> I think most bridges do. <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge didn't have one for a long time, but I think they've talked about it. I don't know. It's not a, not something I've investigated. <laughs> but the no, we, policies, are, you know, this documentation is imperative when you are trying to make this decision on casket, clothes, burial ground and now you got to come out of pocket because you don't know where the insurance policy is or you never checked on it to see if the same company has the you know jurisdiction over that policy or were you grandfathered in when they bought the company 
So what you're saying is every six months or twice a year, whatever, <laughs> spring forward, fall back. Let's let's say that. Then uh, make sure that you know who's handling your life insurance policy. Yeah, and, and that should be in your power of attorney. That you know, um, your you know, if your husband died, you know, in most states, all the property would go to the surviving wife. Also, too, you know, with these insurance policies, you all have to think about stepchildren, adopted children. You know, everybody's going to want a piece. You know, the biggest mess is at a funeral and a wedding. Everybody wants something or don't want something. So, you know, uh, having everything written down makes it so much better. And you don't want it to sit in probate. Uh, Aretha Franklin's been dead two years. Her stuff is still in probate. That's crazy. She has, she has a 65-year-old son that's in an assisted living facility. But she wow. left nobody in charge of him. So now he's a ward of the state. These are things that, yeah. I think that happened with Prince also. So I think that's his right. siblings and Lord knows who. You think people with that kind of money, I think that was the problem. They were afraid somebody would rip them off. Yes, and, 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 and that's the thing that we have to get over is that you can change your power of attorney like you change your underwear. You can, <laughs> <laughs> whoever that person is, if they piss you off, yeah, I mean, it's up to you. You can take their name off and put somebody else on. Just a, it's, it's a, it's a, yes, it's a permanent document, but it can be changed. Like a will, like your driver's license, you, you know what, you can change, like you change, you can change your name in most states for less than a hundred dollars. So you can change your power of attorney. Your healthcare surrogate, who's making these decisions? So if you're not happy with the way they're managing, change it. Change it. That makes change sense. It. You don't have yeah. to worry about offending them. Just do it. That's it. So I know I was my mom's health care surrogate. They had a, my parents had a trust. Mm -hmm. And so my sister and I were co-executors of the trust. But I was the one that got to deal with the health care. Yay me. And, but I don't, I don't remember ever signing anything or do, is that something you just assign? You're like, I'm going to assign this person to be my healthcare surgeon. You don't even have to ask them. Well, you should sit down and talk to them. You should. In a lot of cases, sometimes they don't. They just say, well, I want, you know. The oldest the, child. <laughs> third cousin removed, you know. And another thing, please don't put somebody on your power of attorney that's the same age as you. That's a they good could, point. I mean, they could die and have a heart attack. Or both of y'all could get sick at the same time. And you're each other's power of attorney. Let's, let's get someone a little younger and that could make some wise decisions. Instead of getting someone that's probably the same age as you and may have dementia or Alzheimer's and can't make a decision. I'm just making a suggestion. <laughs> it's actually a really good suggestion because when my dad passed away, it was very clear on his portion of the trust that my sister and I were in charge. Well, no, take that back. That my mom was in charge. On my mom's portion of the trust, it was not at all clear what needed to happen if she was not capable, which mm -hmm. she most certainly was not. We actually had to go to an attorney and pay him to read through her part of the trust on my dad's trust. It was like on the first page, first or second page. It's pretty easy for lay person to find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my sister's got an MBA. I've got a college degree. My husband's been, you know, we, none of us are dumb, right? <laughs> so, exactly. But we, you know, went, you know, when they're two inches thick and you know, we're going through going, what the, you know, holy crap. We were like literally steps away from like, we're going to have to go to court and have her declared incompetent. We went to the attorney. He read through it. He found it. It was like on page 11. It was like, whew, thank goodness. So, you know, make sure some of that stuff's really clear because that was really stressful. It, it, and it has to be clear because when you are in an emergency situation, if you have to pay a bill, you got to make sure that the insurance is not canceled, the house is not foreclosed, the, the car is not repoed, the credit cards aren't canceled, you know, all of this. And then when it's time to sit down with the attorney and say, okay, here's the trust. Here's what's supposed to happen. And you're like, I didn't know. Sit down during the holidays. Do whatever you need to do 
either that once a year or twice a year and say, hey, let's go over this paperwork. We spend more time planning our vacations, our retirement, buying a car. We'll look over all that, buying a house, but we will not take care of this documentation when it comes to our long-term care. And that's where most of our time is spent. That is true. That's where most of our time is spent once we retire. So why isn't this updated? Why isn't it kept up? That makes sense. I know my paternal grandfather, he had um, diabetes and he'd had a surgery that damaged his heart. And mm. it must be where I got the planner, you being a planner, because he had everything laid out. I mean, he had like the funeral plan that, you know, he had it dialed in. And whenever he would try to discuss it with my Nana, she'd be like, I don't want to hear this. So I think some of it is cultural and we're just going to have to get over the fact that, you know, we are not going to get out of this life alive. If you're lucky, you live to 102 and a half like my Nana or not, you know, could get, there's tree grinding going on outside my house today. You know, God knows something. <laughs> my husband could get annoyed and throw me in the, the, the tree grinding up machine. That's gross. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and I have a dog that's almost 13 and he is a mama's boy. And I remind myself the last two dogs didn't live this long. So I remind myself that I could be on borrowed time with him because golden retrievers average age is 12. So he's already surpassed that. And I know that the end is coming. I mean, he's really healthy but he's got arthritis and he's deaf. So that's real fun. And, you know, it's hopefully it won't be horrible when it happens and, you know, it will be sad, right. but I, I think we just try to push off death and push. We don't want to talk about it. We'd rather talk about retirement and vacations and buying a house and weddings and having wedding showers and baby showers. But if there's one person in the family that wants to talk about it, then let them handle it. That's a very good point. If, if there is that one person, if, if the wife wants to talk about it and the husband, baby, you handle it. But then let also to put one of the children in so they'll know where the paperwork is. If something, God forbid, when my parents used to travel with us, we would travel separately. You know, um, my dad would take, you know, and then my mom would take, or, you know, whatever, or they would send us in advance and they would come, you know, so in case anything happened. And so I'm telling, telling people that now too. And I'm glad you brought the thing up about pets is because <clears throat> when you pass in, I think it's 46 states, pets are allowed to be in your will and you can set up a trust for them. Did you hear that, guys? <laughs> I think at least two of the three are in here with me right now. <laughs> but we have to think about our pets because if not, then they go back to the, um, help me, the pound. The breeder, the yeah. Breed, the go back to the And then if nobody gets them, well, we know what happens next. So make arrangements, just like you make your own arrangements, make arrangements for the pets to be taken care of too. And these are things people don't, don't, don't think about. You know, um, so that documentation and power of attorney is important to shut down your Facebook, your IG, your Instagram, <laughs> your Snapchat, your TikTok, walk, all that foolery. <laughs> you have now. You have to have someone, something written it down to shut it down. If not, it stays up. Yeah, my dad has got a Facebook page floating out there somewhere. And kind of a funny story: a Rotarian friend of ours, his father passed away many years ago. He had a Facebook page, and every so often something pops up from dad's Facebook page and the friend says, Oh, it's just dad's way of saying hello. But back on the pets, my sister and I both have pets. My sister has cats and dogs. I've got dogs where I used to live was not conducive to cats because it backed up to open space with birds of prey and coyotes. We had cats when we moved there six months later, no cats. So my parents had a cat and a dog when my dad died and we moved mom into the memory care and regular listeners should know one of the reasons that I picked the memory care that she went to is because they let her keep her dog. And 
I grew up with the same kind of dog that she had, black miniature poodles. I have golden retrievers. I think I said that. But her dog was, my dogs hated her dog. Like my old guy would literally be like, oh, heck, that one's here. And he would literally go sleep in the dog yard, which faced north. So it wasn't even, and it was cement. It was like, it wasn't even cozy. You know, it wasn't like he could go lay in the grass or the sun. No, it was like, I'm going to go lay here by the garbage can because I don't like that dog. Because she just was unruly. And it was awful. And she'd come over to my house and my dad would go and go to the doctor or whatever he would do. And she would howl and scream and carry on. This is why my dog went in the dog yard. He's like... Uh uh-uh cannot deal with that one and there was no way i mean she would pee she knew how to get in and out nope just pee wherever in anger like my dad dropped her off at one day i think they this was quite a few years ago they were going this is the last time they went out my parents went out of town Mm -hmm. so i'm taking care of the dog and i knew like i know this dog so we we walked the neighborhood, which, you know, with golden retrievers, she had to keep up even with the old one, the previous old one, you know, she had to keep up. So I thought we're going to wear you out. First off, you weigh twice as what twice, twice what you should. Well, easy for me to say. And we're just going to walk. And she, I could not believe how good she did. So we get back to the house. I got to take a shower. I basically barricade her into the kitchen where it was tile, get out of the shower. I don't even know how that dog laked to that big. I was like running down the grout. I'm like, there's just no way. So when my dad died, my sister reluctantly took the cat because like I said, bring the cat to my house. It will end up dead because the birds of prey and the coyotes. Just this, I can't, the dogs have their own dog door. I can't keep the cat in with, and let the dogs have in and out privileges. So she reluctantly took the cat and thank God my mom got to keep her dog, (laughs) but they, she was there a year and a half when they renovated the entire community and the executive director who was so sweet, he basically said, well, we kind of need to talk about the dog. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. He's like, well, you know, we're going to be getting um, new carp. Uh Uh-huh. So what you're saying is you want me to rehome the dog? Well, you know, uh, he never, ever said, could you please get rid of the damn dog? (laughs) And I knew she was a problem, but, and my sister and I had been, we were kind of getting torn with, was mom getting any emotional benefit out of the dog? Because it was, the dog was almost like an annoying accessory at that point. And it took a little brow beating because she was a purebred that we, my dad got from a breeder Technically, you, they are co-owned. So my husband mm-hmm. kept, you know, telling the breeder, you know, we gotta, we gotta rehome her, we gotta be rehome her, and the breeder's like, yeah, I'll take her back, I'll take her back. But it was like it, the communication was really spotty, and I finally got to the point where I'm like, call her and tell her the dog is going to the pound if they don't come get her. Well, I ended up having to drive her to Sacramento, which is like an hour and a half from here. It was like 110 and there were fires. So it was like, and the dog screamed in the car the whole time. It was not a pleasant trip, but yeah, make sure you, and make sure that you talk to people about what to do with, you know, like I didn't want a fourth dog and I didn't want a fourth dog who was unruly and old enough. She's a year younger than my oldest. So she's 12. So it's like, you know, you, you can retrain older dogs, but I'm like, I don't have the stamina for that right now. <laughs> so, and yes. That's, and that's it. <laughs> and you are so correct. We don't, you know, when you get to a certain age, you don't want to have to retrain a dog or if something happens and you just get a dog, what do you do? So there's a, in your documentation, again, that power of attorney, where does the dog go? Who Are you going to make a trust where someone can take care of the dog Whatever it is, make those arrangements because if not, you know, they take it to the pound and we all know what's, you know, we know what's next. We know what's next. That is true. There are, the, I was not going to take my mom's dog to the pound. I had already contacted Poodle Rescue and mm-hmm. each breed has their own rescue. We got our youngest from Golden Retriever Rescue. Okay. So that's a much better option than the pound. Um, I don't know. 
I know a lot of places have no kill shelters, so those are okay, but just just skip that step and, and figure out what to do with your cat, your dog, whatever, or your bird. I know people that have birds, and birds live a long time, so my brother-in-law has a bird. <laughs> it's like the bird could outlive the kids that are in his household, so you never know. So we've got our life insurance. We're checking up on that once or twice a year. And our trust, we're keeping that up. We got a plan for our pets. What other documentation do we need to make sure that we have and that we're keeping on top of? Your funeral. I'm so tired of people getting on here with these. I'm going to be nice today. <laughs> <laughs> with these go for me funds. Oh. I'm so sick of that. And, and please look at the disgust on my face. There's no reason in this day and age to have a go for me fund when you can do a prepaid funeral. And even if you don't have the life insurance, you could pay for it in advance and it's taken care of. Prepaid. You can plan everything. My, mine is what hard is getting. And, and, and I'm not a paid spokesperson. I don't get a check. <laughs> but I have everything taken care of all the way down to the food, you know, for the, re, you know, for the repast, where I want to be. I'm not going to be buried. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm doing the anatomical, I'm donating. And that's another thing. If you want your body donated to science, you have to do the paperwork now. It's not like you used to and say, okay, um, we don't have anywhere you can donate this. Everything is about paperwork now. Hospitals don't want to be sued. The funeral home don't want to be sued. The, 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 the place that does the science, the research, they don't want to be sued for taking a the body they're not supposed to take. It's a lot. You yeah. Know, you, well, my yeah. Dad, dad died. I was like, dang. I knew you had to kill a lot of trees to buy a house. You got to kill a lot of trees for, the, for dying. I was surprised at how much paperwork there was. Now, my dad did pre-plan his service and he had planned on paying for it. I don't know what happened. Fortunately, he had two life insurance policies, so that was okay because he had a huge funeral. Um, but he it was kind of funny. My dad is a little, uh, I don't want to say cheap, but <laughs> he did not, he did not go the route as his father. Like my paternal grandfather had, a casket that was lead lined. Don't understand the point of that. And it, it was fancy and unnecessary in my humble opinion, but I'm kind of an environmentalist. He just was like, I'm going to be cremated, put me in the cardboard box and bada bing, bada boo. Well, my dad was a big enough guy. That the cardboard box wasn't an option. Mm. So we had to step it up one, one level for like, I don't know, the pine box or whatever. He was interned at a military cemetery. Unfortunately, thanks to COVID, my mom is still here. <laughs> She's, she was cremated. And you were talking about if you want to donate your body to science. My very first support group, there was a gal from a research, I think it was UC Davis. And they were like, we need, <laughs> sounds terrible, <laughs> we need brains. And I was like, boom, going to donate my mom's brain to science. That had been planned for two years two and a half years and she died and there was one day i was i literally was recording a conversation like we're doing now and if you watch the youtube video you will see it cross my face when i was like oh i didn't do that and i called the funeral parlor and like oh we were just about to call you and tell you her her remains are back and i was like oh, oh i felt like such a terrible person because I had planned on that for so long and then everything happened so quickly. And I mean, I don't want to say it was a surprise, but it kind of was. I just, I was like, I just felt like I can't reverse this error. So my grandmother, my Nana, one that's 102, the other one's been gone for a few years. She said she's donating her body to science. So I got to gotta figure out how to talk to one of my uncles about, is that true? Because occasionally she says things that are a little wacky. And not being able to see and not being able to hear very well and being 102, you're kind of locked into your own personal space. It's like your own personal solitary confinement. I'm sure that's not great for her brain. 
and hey, at 102, if she tells me the same story every week, that's not too bad. At least it's not every 10 minutes like my mom. So yeah, make sure you, if you're going to do a donation, get that all lined up because I kept saying, oh yeah, I got to, I got to figure out how to, who to do that with. And I'm, I'm literally between UC Davis and UCSF. There's a lot of research places pretty easily to get to from here. And well, I blew it. So, <laughs> so you know, those, everything we've talked about is so crucial. And, but what happens is when the person dies, you're so emotional, you know, you, you, you're dealing with a whole lot. So to have everything in one place, and to have it in a, uh, you know, there are a lot of books and things out there now where you can put all the information in a book. You have family history, you know, who died from what, and when and where. And, you know, you can go back 100 years with your family history now where well, you couldn't before. But, you know, all the taboos people used to have about, oh, I don't want my body donated to science. I don't want this. A lot of those things are going out the window now, you know, um, even for my grandparents when they died and it's been more than 20 years ago in the black culture, that was like taboo. Oh, I'm taking all my body parts. I'm not letting anybody, you know, but now it's, you know, everybody, you know, it's like the end thing. It's the end thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting cremated or I'm donating my body to science. I mean, you know, now when we didn't talk about it, now we talk about it, you know, which is a good thing, but talking about it and actually doing it on paper it's two different animals because once you die and if it's not written down, either they're going to bury you or they're going to cremate you, whichever the, you know, the two is that your family decide. But, you know, don't. Um, and, and if you want your organs donated, that, you know, you have to put that, you know, the most driver license places allow you to do that. If you want skin grafts and all that, all that has to be in, written down somewhere. And tell it your family. Been. And tell your family. Because if the hospital comes to you and say, hey, she has a healthy heart, we would like to use it as a transplant. And if my husband or my mother or father says no, but I know I wanted it, then the answer is no, because it's not written down anywhere. Yeah. I knew that was my daughter, my husband, they know my wishes. Pretty sure the almost son-in-law does too. Going to have to make sure... <laughs> Holidays are coming. I'll make sure he knows too. But yeah, that should definitely be written down. I'm assuming you should probably include those instructions in your trust. You so should. One more thing to do. <laughs> it should be included in your trust. It should be included in your healthcare surrogate. I, I, don't care if you, look, I don't care if you repeat it every time in each document. It's there. I know, I know what she wanted. When it comes to the property, when it comes to everything, you know, if you have a favorite brooch, you want to go to somebody, put it in there. I want the brooch to go to Jen. I want the wig to go to Roz. You know, I want the fur coat, <laughs> you know, to go to whoever. Put it in, write it. I'm telling you, because at the end of the day, when it's time to go through this stuff, and if it's already written out, it gives the family comfort and peace of mind that I don't have to guess. And, and it takes that stress off of everybody. It's already a stressful time. Mm -hmm. Why not have this written down? And if you have it written down, in most states when people die, you have to take the, the, the will or whatever to probate. But it speeds the process up because you have it written down versus not having anything written at all. Like with my grandmother, she died. And even though she only had the three children, my, my mother and aunt and uncle had to prove that they were the children. They had to prove that their father had died. They had to get a copy of their wedding license. They had to dig up all of this because my grandmother didn't have all of that together. And over a year, they were in probate court yes. over a house, $2,000 in the bank, and a car that was 15 years old. <laughs> and they had to get permission to sell the house. And, and then after all of that, the court still got 20%. Lord. Yeah, I'm glad my parents had a trust because it was, we had copies. We had a copy on a mm -hmm. <laughs> CD. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and it, that made life easier. And because my husband, prior to being in real estate, was in banking, 
when it was apparent that my dad had literally, we showed up one day and he thought it was 1998. This was in 2016. So it was a definite holy crap moment. My husband having dealt with people who were going through a similar type of crisis when he was in banking, knew exactly what to do about financing, paying for things. The house was paid for, but you know, there's still expenses. And so he called my parents' financial planner, who also was a Rotarian, and said, hey, here's what's going on. And so they worked together. Now that probably wasn't 100% kosher, but because the guy was a family friend of my parents and knew us, you know, he knew it wasn't, you know, shenanigans on our part. It did upset my sister. And my sister to this day thinks my husband did something illegal. It's like my husband made sure that the bills got paid. It was one less stress for you and I, because we were bouncing my poor mom and the dang dog, the fat dog around between their house and my sister's house and my house. Hey, it was not fun for a month, 32 days. My dad was in the hospital. So, you know, it just, trust me, <laughs> make sure people know how to access things. And the one thing that was really super frustrating, we went to AT the AT&T store. My dad was a retiree of AT&T to cancel his, well, we had, I called to cancel his iPhone. And I said, you know, I told him who I was. My father was deceased. I have a death certificate if they need that to be sent to them because, you know, you don't want to just call up and say, hey, I'm Roz's cousin. She died. Cancel her phone. <laughs> that might be a little too simple. And they're like, oh, we're sorry to hear that. Can you give us his pin? No, I cannot. Oh, you can't ask him? No, I just told you he was dead. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I had to tell these people over and over again, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. We finally went to the store and, and, ugh, it was like an hour and a half to get this stupid phone shut off. I'm like, here's the death certificate. Can you just, ugh. That was so frustrating. That's the next thing. In your power of attorney, you need to have all of your passwords, your pins, your usernames, all of that. And then also too, at the time of death, I tell people this all the time, on that bank statement, on that bank account, you need to have a beneficiary because if not, what happens is the funeral home notifies Social Security and everybody. And what do they do? They notify the bank. And within 24 to 48 hours after your death, they shut everything down. And the only people that can get to it is whoever's name is on that beneficiary card. And at the time of death, money is important, particularly if you may not be able to get to the insurance money for 30, 60, 90 days. At least the funeral home will work with you if you have a little bit something to give them. Yeah. So. Oh, and uh, Social Security is real good about going. Oh, you died. <laughs> Boom! Right out of the bank account. Because my dad died on March second, and then, and I think they had already gotten their checks, and it was like, oh no, we're taking this one back. My mom died on March thirty first. The April payment came. Somebody called and talked to my sister. She's like, oh, no, that got sent back. And so then they finally called me, and I'm like, no, it didn't. Just take it out of the bank account. <laughs> like, there's no – don't argue with the uh, Social Security Administration. And it wasn't hers anyway, so or it wasn't ours. So just know that that, could hap that, that will happen. If they pay you and you die, <laughs> you, you don't get to keep it. <laughs> and that's it. So, you know, those – these, these, you know, I, I talk to people about this a lot and I'm adamant about it because six out of 10 people do not have advanced directives. 60% of the United States the people don't have estate planning. Ugh, and, and, I know and so that, many estate planners too. Right. And, and there's no reason for it. Like I said, um, there's no reason for it. There's no reason. There's no reason for these go for me funds. There's so many funeral homes out here now that have the different packages for prepaid planning. You can still have a nice cremation or a nice funeral, probably for less than five or $10,000. And you can lock the price in now because trust me, as each year goes on and now with COVID, <laughs> funeral expenses are going up, you know, and hopefully, hopefully they don't have to do mass graves because they can't keep up. But I'm still waiting to hear from the military cemetery that says we can bring mom to put in the niche with my dad. 
and I had hoped that okay so she died March 31st her how we sold her the home we had rented out her house to pay for some of her care and we were in the process of selling it because it was a 50 year old house and my sister and I don't agree on anything so it's just better to separate everything I was like great you know start and lift the COVID restrictions this is wonderful I will do her celebration of life in her yard of the house that she lived in for almost 47 years yeah that didn't last long <laughs> so I have not been able to do that you know at this point I'm hoping we can have a one-year anniversary celebration of life which is really really seriously frustrating you know and it's like and we didn't my dad wrote his own obituary and with and it was super super expensive he would never ever have published it if he had known how much it cost <laughs> it's ridiculous and i we debated like do we do one for mom it's like the family knows she's gone the you know it's like i don't know who we're gonna so i didn't do an obituary and i think i would have done it had i known we weren't gonna have a celebration of life or a funeral six months later it's like this is ridiculous so it is really helpful to plan ahead because lord knows we could have another one of these kind of years <laughs> hopefully not and you know like i said i'm a planner and so now you're making me feel guilty i gotta go plan some more stuff <laughs> but we've talked about it where i'm like i've never been like my grandparents are buried not far away i kind of wave as i drive by going to the chiropractor but they're not there i don't want to go look at graves I've never been to my paternal grandfather's um resting place since his funeral so i'm like all into cremation or ball me up and make me a tree that's that's my <laughs> you could pick one of those two. <laughs> yeah i gotta use that i gotta use that it is too cute <laughs> well nowadays you can also have some of your cremains turned into a gemstone which part of me kind of was like mm, that's kind of interesting but it's kind of creepy so <laughs> okay i have to okay i mean it would be to me it's like a really creative and beautiful thing to do but you know you put on the ring you're like oh this is mom you know I'm like i don't know about that part <laughs> so it's craziness but yeah see it's like there's options and like Roz said you can pay a little bit every month towards your funeral expenses and that's just one less th thing you know unless you hate your family just plan ahead it's not that painful you know it's and not. you could you i mean we're laughing about some of this conversation and you know you but know, at, the, at, at the end of the day at the end of the day either you can do it or the court will do it that's yeah, it no thanks <laughs> and, and that's what i tell people i say now if you have a problem with the court doing it then let it be then let it be i just had a friend her aunt died and her body is still at the morgue Ooh. and it's been over 30 days they're gonna start charging her aren't they rent i guess so <laughs> <laughs> i know i didn't know they could they probably could charge rent at the morgue you know but well yeah, after 30 days that's kind of getting a little ridiculous well you know it's and because she had no documentation she was a ward of the state i mean it's a big mess because again the paperwork wasn't there and particularly if you have people that have mental problems that are special needs or handicapped this you know if you have a child that's handicapped just like Aretha franklin okay you have you have this child that's in a facility 64 years old and nobody wanted, and, and didn't plan ahead didn't plan ahead now this child is a ward of the state that's Ugh. not fair that's not fair that's not fair to the family. It's not fair to him. No. But like I said, we've we've gone over the paperwork. I, I think we have given great examples of why it's important. You know, from your electronic stuff with Facebook, your social media, your bank, your DD-214, your life insurance, power of attorney, trust, living will, everything, healthcare surrogate, everything, donating your body to science, stop these go for me funds get the pre we i think we have covered it from the rooter to the tutor today <laughs> <laughs> i agree and it's and we still did it in a fun way you know and it's did. like i think i hopefully we've given people the the inspiration to say yeah i really don't want to think about it but the alternative is worse or 
now we've just given them inspiration to give it to creative. someone else. That's give it true. To some, give it to some, if you don't want to do it, give it to someone else. Say, hey, I don't like this, but I know it's got to be done. Can you then go to the attorney and say, hey, do it for me? It'll cost you, but you know, if you don't want to do it, then pay for it. <laughs> it's outsourcing. That's just true. Outs just outsource it. Things I can't do, I outsource. Things I'm not good at, I give someone else to do. That's actually a really good suggestion. I hadn't thought about that one, but my husband and I have complementary skill sets. So, you know, that I'm a planner sense. and he, he's yeah. really good with all this paperwork. So, particularly for those people who are only children or never got married, you, you, you got to do something. You have to do something. So, if you don't want to do it, Meet with the attorney, give them a list of all your assets, all your bank accounts, all your social media, write it up, I'll sign it. That's it. And then it's out of your hands and then it's all taken care of. And that actually sounds kind of pleasant. <laughs> and there's nothing to talk about because if you're only a child, there's nobody to talk to. If you've never been married, you don't have to argue with anybody. You do it your way. Well, even if it even if you have siblings or a spouse, you know, like I said, my grandmother, my nana didn't want to talk about it. Just get it done. You know, they don't want to talk about it, then fine. I'm going to take care of it for you. Boom. Go to the attorney. Here's the up. Boom. Done. Here's where you find the information, honey. And, and most attorneys that do these things, they'll, they'll have it put into a nice little box for you, and you can set it on the shelf like a book, <laughs> and, when it, and you, you, you get that book. Or if you don't want it sitting out in, for public view, take it to the bank and put it in the um, save the deposit box, but make sure someone has a key and can get in. Yeah, it costs cost a little pretty penny when you have to uh, have the lock drilled out. The bank don't like to do that. At least that's what I recall from the hus husband's banking days. Yeah, so, but that's, this, that's it. That's awesome. Well, this has been fantastic, and I'm glad that uh, I think you reached out to me. Somebody reached out to me, and you made a list. So you made it really easy for me. You're like, oh, this is a topic we haven't talked about. Let's do that one. <laughs> well, thank you again for letting me come on. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate your words of wisdom. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.